Hi, welcome to this, the final presentation of the Collectors Conference, our first Collectors Conference at allaboutstamps.co.uk. Really hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we've really enjoyed putting it together and working with the Great Britain Philatelic Society. So thanks to everyone involved. Uh, the final talk today um, is from Barry Stagg. Barry's gonna to talk to us about King Edward VIII stamps. Um, so it's over to you, Barry. Hello, and welcome to this talk on Britain's King Edward VIII stamps, uh, your stamp coils uh, and booklets. I hope you find it interesting. Um, as we all know, George, George V died on January the 20th, 1936, and Edward came king straight away. Uh, fairly quickly, the post office decided that they wanted to get some stamps out um, uh, for his reign. And very quickly again, they decided they want to do this in three phases. Uh, the first one, first phase was the ascension phase, where they wanted to get these out by July of 1936. So they only had six months to do this. Um, then they get uh, some stamps out for the coronation, which was going to be in May 1937. And then after that, uh, they would have the, the normal definitive um, issues uh, coming after uh, the coronation. Um, to help speed up the work, uh, the post office decided not to go out to, uh, to tender, not to ask artists and engravers for their ideas. They went straight to Harrison's, and Harrison's, uh, being the printer of the day, um, came up with some ideas. Uh, the first one here is um, shown on the right hand side, which they did in April. Um, it was in four colours. Um, the post office took this to the king, and he didn't like it. Uh, the post office asked Harrison's to make some modifications, which largely consisted of changing um, the tablet from uh, uh, four, uh, four pence to one and a half, and putting two more colours on, which I've shown two of them here. Um, and again, he didn't like it. You will notice on the bottom there, uh, I've shown uh, some of the, the block cipher, which was the watermark used on the, um, the stamp paper. Uh, the left hand one being George V, and because Harrison's didn't have um, watermark paper for Edward VIII, uh, they used the George V stocks. Uh, the Edward VIII one um, came out for the stamps, or was available for the stamps proper some months later. Uh, you'll notice that for the first time, the eight is actually in Arabic, not in Roman numerals. Uh, there was two reasons, I uh, believe, for this. One was that um, EV111R would be a bit long to put across a stamp um, and it might not all go in uh, and secondly they thought the 111 would actually thin the paper out too much so they uh, went to Arabic which um, I think looks quite nice. Now as I said they didn't, um, they didn't the post office did not go out to, uh, to tender or to ask people for uh, designs and they wanted to speed things up but that didn't stop people putting the submissions in, and a wide range of people um, did put um, suggestions to the post office. Um, uh, two of the most famous ones are here. On the left-hand side, uh, this is from the Williams brothers, a uh, very famous philatelist of the day, and they came up with some bromides, these three bromides, uh, which they put to the post office who rejected them, uh, then they put some more in, which I'm, I don't show, but those are also rejected. Uh, but there's also this one from a Hubert Brown on the right hand side, uh, which um, Harrison's did like and got their own people to make a stamp of his basic design, uh, which you see there. And uh, they rather liked this and the post office liked it. And ultimately the king saw that design and liked it. And that was the foundation for the stamp. Now what nobody knew at the time uh, was that Hubert Brown in fact was a schoolboy. and he, uh, he eventually got some credit for doing this, but not a lot, and certainly uh, not much financial reward. So this takes us to um, the coronation essays they started working on um, in late 1936. Um, and they came up with a whole variety of designs. In fact, the first five essays, three of which I show at the top here, um, show the king in the uniform of the Welsh Guards. Um, this time they did go to the Fine Arts Commission because they did get some criticism uh, for not going uh, for, the, uh, for the Ascension 
uh, issue. So this time they did, and Harrison and Sons and the Post Office um, sent this to the Fine Arts Commission, and not surprisingly, they came back with a range of, suge range of suggestions, and which they made some changes to, and some further designs, and so further essays we produced, another six uh, we produced, I've shown three of them here, um, and they sent those to the Commission on, in September 1936. Uh, the Commission took a couple of months uh, to suggest further alterations, but before much could happen, the 10th of December 1936 came along and the King abdicated. Um, could I just mention two things while we're on this page? On the top line, uh, in the middle there, the, uh, the pink coloured one, uh, in the middle of the top line, you'll notice the motifs of the four countries, the rose, the thistle and the shamrock. And in the bottom left hand corner is the daffodil. I believe this is the first representation of the daffodil on British postage stamps. And had that design been picked, it would have been the first time the daffodil would have been used in a series of, of British stamps um, as a symbol of Wales. I would also like to mention the 10th of December 1936 date. Uh, you often see uh, the abdication of either called the 10th or the 11th. Um, the 10th is actually when um, he signed uh, the bit of paper in front of his brothers that um, he was giving up. Uh, the 11th of December is when it went through the formalities of government um, and parliament. So sometimes you see both. Um, very early on, uh, the post office uh, approached the king uh, with a few suggestions for Edward Cipher. This was because Royal Mail was carried free by tradition uh, by the post office. Um, Edward had particular ideas uh, on things and he liked things simple and nice and clean. He didn't like any of their suggestions, drew a sketch of what um, he thought would be a good one. Post office went away and turned that into something uh, a bit more presentable. And here you see it there, ERIV 111. Um, and he used that um, throughout his 11 month reign. Interestingly, this, the hand stamp is actually upside down, uh, but it's actually the 30th of December, 36. So uh, this was some time, some weeks after he had abdicated, but he was still using it. So this is the issue stamps, and immediately you can see the likeness with the brown um, idea. And I think they're a nice, simple, straightforward stamp. Uh, it didn't get universal approval, but it got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, good press. Uh, and people generally like them, the public certainly like them. They were issued on the 1st of September, uh, except the uh, the penny, which is on the 14th of September. Uh, they were issued in the streets of 240. Um, I'm often asked why was there a two week difference between the two, uh, between the 1st of September for three stamps and the penny on the 14th. Um, I believe that was simply because the post office had lots and lots of George V pennies still left and they wanted to make sure um, that they used them all up. Um, if you do the maths, um, you can see from the bottom, uh, 702 million uh, penny stamps were printed over the 11th month, 11 month reign. So that's about 60 million penny stamps required every month for British postage. Um, two weeks, that's some 30 million stamps they had um, to, to use up. And the post office was meticulous with its accounting and it certainly would have wanted to throw those away. You'll see um, at the bottom there as well, um, the figures for all those which were sold over the 11 months. And these are huge figures, you know, 1.8 billion um, penny halfpenny stamps uh, actually sold a tremendous figure. Um, they covered, of course, the paper rate and uh, the postcard rate. Postcards were still very, very popular in this period. Uh, and the basic internal and empire rate, uh, the penny halfpenny, and uh, the topney halfpenny, the foreign rate. And perhaps it, uh, it's a sign of the times, but I must admit, empire rate and foreign rate does grate a little bit with me. Uh, but there we are, that's what they call it on the day. Uh, and it's interesting that you could send a letter, uh, a basic rate letter to Australia for a penny halfpenny, but it cost you two, uh, two and a half pence to send it to France, for instance. Um, very uh, interesting. Okay, um, uh, these are the um, the issued stamps. Um, 
I've shown here on the left hand side the first cylinder used, uh, which was cylinder four. Um, and on the right hand side, the last cylinder used, cylinder um, 26. Um, you will notice that uh, there's an A36, the so called control on one, and A37. These represent the, the years these were printed, and this is for the accountancy purposes. Um, the four you'll notice has no dot after it, and the 30, 26 in the margin on the right hand side does. This was because when they, uh, when they printed these on the roller, the left hand side had, um, had no dot and the right hand dot side had the dot because you had two panes side by side. So every revolution of the cylinder was 480 um, stamps were produced. Um, and as an aside, uh, if you do a very quick bit of maths, um, you know how many stamps were totally produced or certainly sold uh, if there was roughly 500 every time the cylinder went round, that was um, 200,000 revolutions of every cylinder. Um, that's a, a lot of wear, so I'm not surprised they went through 13 cylinders. Here we have seven, seven, seven cylinders, did 702 million stamps again, um, from cylinder 2 to cylinder 14. And for their biggest um, uh, sales, the Penny Hapney, 15 cylinders used, um, oh, sorry, printed 1.8 billion stamps. That's an amazing figure, an amazing figure. I thought I'd show you a couple of the, uh, the errors. There are um, three or four constant errors, which are worth looking at for. Um, and the first one, uh, the pearl in the crown, uh, you can find this on the bottom row on the second column and hopefully you can see a little dot. Um, this is sharper in some of the earlier printings uh, and then gradually it wears away to a, a very fine ring. But you can see it just with the naked eye. Uh, and this was from cylinder 7 uh, and also appeared on 10 and 12. So it was a, a, what they call a multi-positive. Um, they use the same screen uh, to produce a cylinder for seven as ten and twelve, and it's exactly the same fault. Um, and very collectible, very collectible. Um, the penny halfpenny is the 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 hair quaff. Um, this is uh, what they call state six, where the cylinder has gone through a, a variety of changes. Uh, the, the slightly earlier state, state five, actually shows it a lot more, and it's like a, a small eruption of the hair. Um, you can just about see this uh, with the naked eye, um, but it is one of the, uh, the faults to look out for. And you can see this on the first, um, first column on row 18 um, of cylinder two. I thought you'd like to see these. These are rather nice um, errors, they're one-off errors. Um, the left-hand one where uh, there's been a mirror, mirror image has been caused by the sleevage being folded over when the printing is still wet, obviously uh, as accident, and I think it looks quite nice. Um, King Edward look at it himself. Um, that's quite a nice, nice piece there. And on the right hand side, um, a straight sheet there, or part of a sheet, where the inking is, um, is drying out, possibly towards the end of a run, and you see it's very, very mottled and there's no thickness to the paint at all. Uh, but I rather like that. So taking us to the last stamp in the set of four, um, the two and a half pence. The uh, only two cylinders were used as far as we know, 31 million, so not the biggest numbers. Um, but instead of having an A37, um, they actually put a little uh, engraved line under the 36. And they did this for, uh, say for accountancy purposes. But of course, by the time they got into 1937, the King had already abdicated making new cylinders was expensive, um, so they didn't want to um, engrave a new cylinder um, just for the final uh, final few months of use. So there we are, that's um, quite a nice one. And there is one constant error, uh, which is visible to the naked eye. Um, this is the, uh, the dot in the ear, or the spot in the ear, or the speck in the ear, it's all different things. You can just, well you can see it with the naked eye, you'll find it on the last column, uh, on the 13th row, you will see the uh, stamp uh, sheet uh, divider, the halfway line uh, markings just above it, 
Uh, so the one he found was 11, 12, 13th one, um, and it's in the year. And it's quite a nice, uh, nice fault to find. And uh, under a magnifying glass, it looks, uh, looks very prominent. So I thought I'd uh, show you some usages of, um, uh, of the stamps. On the left hand side there you have um, a nice uh, paint stamp with some perfume, so suggesting this was uh, a business use. Um, it is uh, dated the 10th of December, I think purely by chance, uh, the date of the abdication, which makes it a little bit more interesting. And this is the sort of thing you would have had invoices in, for instance. Uh, on the right hand side, straightforward postcard, uh, it's actually a Pacbo uh, postcard uh, sent to London, uh, sent to London. Um, from a ship which went into Southampton, the British ship which came into Southampton. So some of the uh, internal and foreign uh, mail. The, uh, on the left hand one, this, right, this envelope intrigued me a little bit, undelivered for reasons stated, and when you look on the back it says the firm is defunct, which is not an expression I'm aware the post office used today. Uh, and uh, yeah, quite, quite a nice marking. Uh, Perhaps the postman was um, terribly annoyed and that's why he stamped it twice, um, returned to sender. And on the right hand side, uh, another pack though, uh, and this one um, posted from the British ship uh, entering the Panama Canal um, back in April 1937. The 1930s was a great time for new airmail routes. And I know there are a lot of um, airmail collectors out there. And I thought I'd put these two in. I, I rather like these. Um, the left-hand one was a letter down to um, Dar es Salaam in um, May 1937. And not, it's a correct postage rate, but um, it's a, an interesting, and I think it is a, I think it is a, a proper um, commercial letter. Um, I can't imagine a stamp collector, for instance, would have put the the penny uh, ain't stamp over the uh, airmail label. Um, so I'm rather pleased with that. Uh, it's been in the wars a little bit, but it's all quite a nice, um, a nice grouping there. Um, you will notice the left hand um, Hapley has the perforations on the top missing, suggesting to me this was um, possibly from a stamp booklet where the perforations um, can range from nothing to uh, the complete perforation. Uh, as you would see on the bottom, uh, the lowest of the, the hapneys, where you've got the complete hole. Um, so I suspect these were from um, a booklet. Um, the right hand side, um, this was the first, it's a first flight one, uh, down to, New, to Lagos in Nigeria. Um, and again, it's got some nice markings and clear markings. Um, I suspect, as it's dated the 16th of October, the first day, this was a, a philatelic item, if you want to be a purist, but nevertheless, it's a, it's, a nice, um, it's a nice envelope with a nice selection of stamps on. Um, again, the poached egg and the bisect stamps I, I rather like. They're an interesting use. Uh, they are called poached egg, because this is the left hand of uh, the three, because it looks like a poached egg. Uh, they clearly were used by the technicians who were repairing, um, testing um, the uh, dispensing machines and they needed something, the post office weren't going to give them real stamps, so they came up with this idea of these poached egg stamps. Unfortunately, they used the colour for them, which was readily available, i.e. the, the halfpenny. And I've seen lots and lots of these um, being used um, through the mail. I have never, I think ever, I think it's true to say, seen one with a to pay label on, which of course it's not valid for postage, um, but the vast majority seem to have gone through now, whether it was done by accident um, or um, uh, design, who knows? Um, but again, they make a, a, an interesting side collection. And on the right hand side, uh, we have um, the penny bisect. Uh, as far as I'm aware, the post office never sanctioned uh, bisects in this country, um, but clearly people ran out um, of stamps and you do see them and they're reasonably common um, to find. And again, I um, very, rarely, very rarely see one with a to pay label on. Uh, they, the post office were quite happy um, to take them through the system without any problem. So moving on to stamp rolls. Um, 
altogether there were 10 um, rolls uh, produced for different purposes. Um, you'll notice that the headers are the same colour, approximately the same colour as the stamps. It makes it easier for the, uh, uh, for the staff. Um, this one, uh, they come in different sizes, uh, all values except the penny halfpenny. There was never a penny halfpenny roll. Um, so this is the, the halfpenny one. And you'll notice uh, from the date there, um, the first roll was on the 18th of December 1936. So a week after the king had abdicated, um, which is interesting. Uh, and the bottom one you'll see there, um, one with a piece of wax on, which um, on the roll, they had a bit of ribbon round. I have a little bit of it left there. Um, and the wax kept it all in place. And they're quite hard to find with, uh, with the wax and, and a bit of the, uh, the ribbon still on it. So I'm quite pleased with that. And here's two examples of the pennies. As I said, the machines were basically into two categories. Uh, you could find machines in the post office, uh, on the walls on the post office, uh, where you could help yourself uh, outside the post office. And um, so at any time, day and night, you could um, get your stamps. And some of them, uh, these machines, were used by businesses, particularly big businesses, um, so they didn't have to keep trotting along to uh, the post office to get their penny stamps. Um, at the top one, you'll notice only 4,000 rolls were sold, uh, which 4,000 is a large number, but in stamp world, that's quite small. Um, so I was quite pleased to come across this some time ago. Um, they all were um, available through all of 1937, and it wasn't until the Georgia VI rolls started to turn up did, um, did they take these out of service. So stamp books. I find these are a quite fascinating topic. Um, there were four stamp books uh, in value. Uh, the top left hand one, this plain buff coloured one, no advertising. It just contained two panes of two one and a half, uh, one and a half pence stamps. And there's a two shilling, three shilling, and five shilling booklets which had adverts on the front cover, the back cover, and uh, in the case of the two shilling and five shilling inside as well. Um, you could see on the top the uh, there are staples, whereas others use stitchings. And it wasn't uncommon for the stitching to come out in manufacture. And again, the post office being very careful with money, didn't want to lose the value of the stamps. So they used uh, reprinted um, front covers and stapled them, literally stapled them through. And again, uh, there's quite a few of those around and they make a nice and interesting collection. Um, in terms of the blue ones, there were 32 different types uh, of uh, blue designs. So where it says Bovril for fitness, they often had other things in there. Um, the five shilling, they only had two, um, and the three shilling, um, they had 13 different advertisements on the front cover. Um, but the uh, three shilling had nothing inside in terms of advertising, just the sheets, and just the stamps themselves. And here are uh, some selections of the stamps themselves. Um, on the bottom right hand corner, you see the, the small stamp booklet one with just two panes like that. Uh, we'll put inside that little teeny buff coloured um, uh, booklet and uh, that was dispensed from the machines, the number of machines. Um, I showed the, two, the three values there. Um, the, the two and a half pence was never used inside the booklet. Um, the, the penny, penny halfpenny and halfpenny were and they all come with three different um, styles of perforation. And if you look at the arrow in the bottom left hand corner, or the one I've labelled A, you'll notice there's no continuation hole of the horizontal perforation. Um, it just butts up nicely to the vertical perforation. Um, if you look at B on the other hand, in the top right hand corner, uh, you will notice um, one extension hole horizontally in the middle there. And on the top left, C, you'll see the perforation going all the way across. And you find these on the penny, penny, halfpenny, and halfpenny. And again, they're, they're a nice thing to collect. Um, there's lots of variety in there. Um, you also notice on the halfpenny on the bottom left of that, 
there's an E2 dot to match the cylinder number. There were different cylinders, um, um, about two, sometimes four cylinders used uh, to print these. Um, and again, it's nice to find um, all these cylinders. Some of them are incredibly difficult to find. And the stamp advertising panes. Um, there were 16 different types of advertising panes. Uh, and I don't have time to go through them all. Um, but here are just a sample of four of them. Um, for those of you who are under the age of 50, uh, you perhaps don't realize that the post office was responsible both for the telephone and the mail um, in, back in the day. Um, so there was lots of advertisements for please come on a telephone and speak to us over the phone. Um, airmail, as I mentioned earlier on, um, was the incoming thing. So they were telling you to, uh, uh, to use the airmail service. Uh, people wanted to save money in those days. So saving money uh, was one and there's certainly some commercial banks who advertised as well. Uh, and these you can find um, inside those booklets. And there's a lot of study on which adverts go with which booklets. And there's a, a number of little varieties, uh, which again, makes it fun to, uh, to look after. Well, I thought you'd like to know roughly what else the people advertised with. Uh, there was certainly a card game uh, being advertised, wardrobe fittings, um, stamp collecting. In fact, there's a nice stamp collecting one. Um, you know, please be a stamp collector. And um, one for furniture. And the one I particularly like is lingerie ribbons, which does uh, stir the imagination perhaps, um, but they were advertised in there as well. Um, I hope I've um, interested you um, in the stamps of Edward VIII. Uh, there's many, many, many more there, but I just don't have time to show you them all. Um, I've given you a few references there. Um, uh, the most famous one perhaps is Kirk, uh, which is reference number four there. Uh, that little booklet uh, can be found fairly easily on uh, one of the um, uh, one of the uh, online auction sites uh, for quite a reasonable price. Um, you could also um, get a copy of the King Edward VIII to King George VI Specialist Stamp Catalogue, which perhaps is not so reasonably priced. And there are lots and lots of articles in most of the stamp magazines uh, going back some years um, and you can find lots of those and last one I would mention is the um, a great um, uh, Great Britain Philatelic Society's website has a huge collection of journals and you can search those and find lots of um, Edward VIII. I picked out one because I mentioned the Curious Quaff and Robin's uh, paper and other papers on Edward VIII are always worth a read. Um, if you want to have, if you're interested in the essays, uh, then the Postal Museum used to have, they don't anymore sadly, I had four postcards which show um, all the different stamps and um, many I haven't had time to show you. Um, and again, now available on various auction sites. So thank you for, thank you for listening. Thank you for staying this long with me. Uh, I hope you found it um, stimulating and um, Thank you and goodbye. Barry, thanks so much for that. Um, really interesting. I loved um, some of the items you've got there, the stamp booklets, uh, the advertising panels on them. Really interesting. I love those. Um, one of the things that struck me, um, you might want to, to kind of uh, expand upon, is just King Edward VIII stamps. You kind of look at them in the catalogues, um, just going back in history, and you think, OK, there's a couple of stamps there. I can easily uh, complete that collection pretty quickly but it's not quite so simple from uh, what you've shown us is it no well that's how i started in fact um, i'm usually a thematic collector and um, um oh, many years ago now 20 30 years ago i wanted something which was bounded um yeah so i thought hey four stamps you know like, there's a yeah. few varieties got the booklets hey that's gonna be easy you know yeah. um but yeah <laughs> Um, you're absolutely right. Um, there's a tremendous amount, and there are some people who collect nothing but um, the booklets, which could be a lifetime study. Um, there's an awful lot there. Um, other people like going through the, the sheet stamps, looking for uh, minute flaws, which you can't see uh, without a magnifying glass. Um, each to their own. I think it really does uh, throw open a whole range of things, and it is reasonably well defined. And the stamps are 
you know, reasonably cheap compared to many. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. You know, if someone was wanted to start um, an Edward VIII collection, is it difficult to find the material? And you know, uh, is there anything that's really very expensive? Um, the um, the individuals, well, the individual stamps, um, uh, you can buy them for next to nothing. Um, uh, yeah. If you go onto a well-known auction site, there are thousands. Um, the quality is not always good, uh, and people do think they're worth a lot more than they are. But certainly, um, uh, getting nice blocks of four or six of any of the values for many a cylinder would be within the, the range of any schoolboy's pocket money. Um, some of the cylinders are rarer than others. Um, but the vast majority would would be in the five ten pound range. There are some uh, which are a lot more. What I didn't mention was the different perforations because that takes a, a lot more explaining. And some of the perforations tend to get into the hundreds of pounds. Um, um, the the coils are reasonably easy to find. The vast majority, except two coils, which even I can't find. I've seen uh, one of them in an auction many many years ago, but I've never seen any more for sale. Uh, and these were for the higher values, which um, uh, just so few of them, um, I suspect the vast majority were destroyed. Yeah. Um, and the booklets, the booklet panes, um, again, if you don't want one with the cylinder number on, uh, which can be a bit more expensive, uh, most of those 16 panes can be found quite easily. Mm. But the trick is, do you want really good perforations or not? Um, because the way they were produced, they often were cut short and so it was like, it was a terribly, um, it, it didn't look particularly pleasing to the eye, but uh, they were still valid and everything. They, they just weren't cut very well. But those could be done reasonably cheaply, one or two exceptions. Um, the expensive, by most people's definition, were the essays. Uh, but fortunately, most of the essays some time ago, um, and the prices have gone up since then. Um, but so few of them are available on the market. And they often put out on silly prices, so I ignore them. Um, but they are available. They are available. Yeah. Okay. So there's something for everyone, really, isn't there? Mm. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think so. Yes. Okay. Um, what have you got a particular item that's a favourite of yours? If you had to pick one. Yes. The um, the, uh, the essay uh, with the daffodil. Uh, I'm one of my other hats. I I, I love daffodils and. Um, <laughs> and um, I have a daffodil collection. Um, and in fact, that's how I came across this particular one. I didn't come it through looking for Edward VIII. I was looking for daffodils. Um, <laughs> and I think that's quite an exciting find. Um, I obviously didn't go anywhere, but nevertheless, it, I, being the first possibility, uh, serious possibility, I think was a nice one. I rather like it. It's a nice color as well. Um, uh, not too complicated a uh, stamp. Uh, I rather like it. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time, Barry. That's been really, really, really interesting. And I'm sure it's kind of inspired people to, to have another look at, at something that they maybe think is, yes. as you say, just a couple of stamps. So that's fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure, Matt. My pleasure.